This is the most combat experienced aircraft in the history of aviation. With all those fixed wing things all over the place, never done nothing, never been nowhere. And this bird's been everywhere, done everything. I think it had like <clears throat> over seven million hours of combat time. Seven million hours, 16 million sorties or something. And when you pull up on the collective, you pull it up, it synchronizes, it keeps the RPM constant, and it's powerful. And the Huey would do anything we ask it to do. It was like, like going from a Model A to a Rolls Royce. a rare moment when uh, probably one of the most experienced Huey pilots in history, Medal of Honor recipient General Brady, is going to tell us about this aircraft that has meant so much to so many people that the very sound of its rotors are iconic. And we're just going to walk around and have General Brady tell us what this machine did and how, how they did it with he and his crew. So if you can start. Okay. <clears throat> the uh I think what was so mo so important about this aircraft is I learned to fly in an H-23. We called it Hiller the Killer. If you could hover that thing, uh, it was over. Hovering it, just getting the, that bird to hover was, was the most difficult thing about flying it. It had a motorcycle grip. Every time you, to keep the, uh, the RPM in the green, every time you moved any part of your body, you had to move all the rest of your body. Your both legs, both arms, and a wrist. Now that was a trick to fly. I came within probably five minutes of busting out of flight school. Uh, I think 40% of the people who went there busted out in those days. Later on there was a demand, so they needed it. And so to, to fly something like that in combat, like they did in, in Korea, by the way, where they had the patient on pods, uh, same, same difficult system of flying, the motorcycle grip, and, and by the way, it's the opposite of a motorcycle. So every time I got on a motorcycle after that, I'd fall off, because I turned the son of a gun the wrong way at the wrong time. But in Korea, you got p pods here where they put the patients. Now, I took an orientation ride in, when I was going to flight school in an H-13 in the pod. Couldn't touch the patient in route, couldn't do anything for him, very restricted at night and weather. <clears throat> and when the patient sometimes would wake up in that pod, he thought he was in a friggin' coffin. So it was not good for the mental health of the patient. He couldn't get out, he's strapped out on the skids. Now, we go to Vietnam <clears throat> after I get out of flight school. I had about a, oh, a few hours at Rucker in this bird. When I got to Vietnam, I couldn't even start it. But the beautiful thing about this, we got turbine engines, and when you pull up on the collective, there's none of this shit. You pull it up, it synchronizes, it keeps the RPM constant, and it's powerful. And the Huey would do anything we ask it to do. It was like, like going from a Model A to a Rolls Royce. When we came out of the 
the old the motorcycle grip helicopters, the H-19, the H-34, the H-23, H-13, and we went into this thing, it was just like heaven. So I got checked out in combat missions. I couldn't start it when I got to Vietnam, but I could fly it. In fact, just about anybody that had flown any helicopter could fly this. It was so forgiving. Uh, the most important part of it as far as patient care goes is you could treat the patient in route. In other words, we had on here a medic who was trained in every kind of traumatic double amputation, sucking chest wounds, belly wounds, you name it. He did it on a daily basis. Tracheostomies, he did it. And he could do it back here. And the great medics, the good medics, could start an IV in a bird that's going like this. It's vibrating all the time. <clears throat> but they would start it. We, most of the time, we had the guy in the hospital from within like 30 minutes of the time he was shot, he was in an operating room. And that's why, they, why the survival rate was so great. Very seldom used uh, <clears throat> litters in combat. A couple key things. First of all, they take up room. <clears throat> I don't care what you are, unless you're a back or neck per patient, you don't need a litter. You could be no legs, no arms, whatever. They got them in there, the medic got on them, stop the, wound, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, and treat for shock. Boom. Get him in the hospital. The physicians are going to save his life if he's alive when we put him in the tent with the with the surgeons. We had we had to learn so much the hard way. <clears throat> there was no book on flying helicopters in combat. Uh, it was done in Korea, but on a very limited basis. In fact, my unit, my second tour in Vietnam, carried more patients with three of these than were carried by all the helicopters in Korea during the whole Korean War. Over 21,000 patients for three of these birds. So flying it, understanding how to get into areas under certain circumstances, enemy situation, weather, uh, the terrain, all those things you had to crank together in your mind and then figure out. And if you did it right, a highway would spring right out of the sky and take you right into the area. In the early days, we had no radio communication because almost all of our patients were Vietnamese. So we tried different techniques. <clears throat> We'd make a low pass to see if we saw any sea rations or something, uh, but you couldn't talk to them on the phone. And so you learned different things to say, different things to look for, because so often we would land right in the middle of the VC. And before you know it, the damn aircraft's full of holes and your people shot. So I could say to this day, Cha Dia Chi Kua Ong, which in Vietnamese says, pop smoke. Now that was the first thing. The second thing was, the guy on the ground would roll out a smoke bomb for you, and he'd say, okay, dust off. If he could talk to you, if it was an American advisor there, <clears throat> green smoke, look for green smoke. Well, you'd look down there, and there was four or five green smokes. And so we knew that the other guy was listening to us on the radio. And so how do, how, what do we do now? <clears throat> so we said, all right, here's the deal, guys. You pop smoke, I will identify it. So the guy on the ground or whoever says, the smoke is out, dust off. And we say, Roger, I got green smoke. Roger, come on in, that's us. And then even the color of the smoke was important because green smoke in a, in a ripe rice paddy is hard to see. Uh, red smoke at night is hard to see. Yellow smoke was the best. Purple smoke was good. So you had to make sure that you use those things as well because the terrain was always so thick and so difficult and the confined areas were so tight that you wanted to make sure at night we use flashlights, lighters, anything that would flicker at night so that we, we could get in. We flew at night without any lights. We shot blackout approaches. You turn on your your uh, landing light or your searchlight and the enemy knows exactly where you are and where the guys are, are on, the, on the ground. I always flew the right seat. <clears throat> and the reason I flew the right seat was because you lead with the right pedal. And when you lead with the right pedal, when you got a load on, what does that do? That reduces the demand on the engine and gave, gives you more lifting power in that bird. And I also, when you had a heavy load, 
as you know in a helicopter you got to hit translational in order to fly if you got a heavy load I would lead with the right pedal and and get translational sideways because I could get it easier than if I went like this forward get translational sideways and then shift into the wind and then you get off the ground because sometimes if you had you know very difficult sometimes to control the load when there's a whole bunch of people hurt they're all fighting to get on I never had to throw anybody off I heard cases where they had and the people on the ground then would shoot at the helicopters bad news so I would always make sure and these are things that we learned from trial and error we would lock one door we would load them through one door and the people my medic and crew chief would then make sure we got the most serious on first and then the least serious and uh, then if we had to come back god forbid we would call another bird in to get him get him <clears throat> and the other thing oftentimes a guy who goes the guy goes through flight school his ip flew the left seat so he admired he looked up to his ip and he wanted to fly the left seat and so they all liked the left seat because it made him feel like they were a big shot pilot or something the problem with the left seat was the landing light and the searchlight are controlled from the right seat. And so are all the good instruments are on the right seat. We had so many guys go in at night saying, shine it over here. Crazy shit. So they could be in the left seat. So I insisted always with my pilots, you will fly the right seat where you control the searchlight and the spotlight. So that when you're going in, you are controlling, because the searchlight will shine wherever you wherever you want it to if you're in the left seat you got to tell the guy shine it over here and that was the last words of several crews shine it over here boom they're all dead so but this bird was uh, we started out with the B model which was I don't know how many inches shorter than this it probably came up to you probably had about this much room in the B model but the beautiful thing about the B model was that uh, it was flat at night. The, the worst thing about the Black Hawk is it sits like this. Your visibility is horrible, just horrible. I don't know how those guys, of course they've never had to fly in, in real terrain at night with that bird. It's always desert or something like that. But the B model was beautiful. Uh, and then they stretched it, put about an L9 engine in, a, in the D model UE, underpowered. So, General, you flew 2,000 missions in this, or? I flew between 2,500 and 3,000 missions. 2,500 and 3,000. And on, on what percentage of those missions, when you got in that, did you know what you were getting into? Is every one? Never. You never, never, knew. never, never, never. So that means you must have had tremendous confidence in this helicopter. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, we could have never, we could have never done what we did in Vietnam. With this helicopter, we rescued almost one million people men women children enemy friendly scout dogs everything you couldn't go out in a like an h19 or an h34 where you're not sure if you're going to have enough uh, you know if you're, you don't you don't know if you got enough lift to get you out of the area with this thing you I always knew that I could get out of the area and not only that I knew I could come in very very fast which made it difficult for them to hit you and I could make it I could stop without flaring it which is dangerous and I could get out fast. you aren't going to pick up wounded because there's nothing going on you're almost yeah. constantly landing in a bad situation you get it on the ground and now somebody's got to get those wounded on board tell me a little bit about your relationship to your crew chief and the medics and the guys yeah. that work for you Okay, you got a you got a mission that came in that gave you the location, the call sign, the radio frequency, the number of patients, what was going on in the area. It was never accurate. The guy on the ground couldn't see everything, but he had one thing and one thing on his mind and that get my wounded buddies out of here. So he would not say anything to make you think I can't get in there. He's not going to say we're under fire. The area is insecure. No, he's going to lie to you about it, and so would I. So we we developed a system, and our unit was kind of unique. We went any time, day or night, for any kind of patients. So if we got a call at three o'clock in the morning, and the guy's got ringworms, we're going to go get him. 
I don't care whether it's considered dangerous or not dangerous, we're going to go get him. And what we developed by doing that is they didn't lie to us. They would say, dust off, the area is insecure. Now, you got to have a standard. You can't just go get yourself killed. So our standard was this. <clears throat> we will come in if you will stand up and help load the patients. That's all we ask. My crew members got out, their, their targets, both of them got out to start loading the patients and we asked the guy on the ground, you do just this, you stand up and help my guys load. You'd be surprised how many areas we went into, they wouldn't stand up. And so my guys had to go out and find the patients, drag them to the aircraft, put them on, and the rest of them are laying in the dirt, won't help us. So that was our standard. Don't tell me, don't talk to me about security. It has no meaning. Security to you is like 50 yards. For me, it's a quarter of a mile. So I don't want to hear security. You just tell me where the enemy is, what kind of weapons he's got, and will you stand up and help load and we're coming in. Just that easy. And that's, uh, that settled all the overclassification, all the lying, all the bullshit that goes on between on radios when communications in a, in a, in a tight situation is difficult. The sound of that rotor is yeah. just synonymous with the Vietnam conflict. Is there anything in particular about this rotor or this configuration that people might not generally know about the Huey or anything you want to particularly point out about that? I'm not an engineer, but the one thing that interested me most was the Jesus nut. <clears throat> the Jesus nut is the nut on top. And so when you, before you went on a flight, of course you pre-flighted the aircraft, but that's the thing you looked at, and we called it the Jesus nut, because if that ever came off, that's the end of it. So I always would check the Jesus nut. Uh, no, it's a turbo, constant RPM, uh, tremendous uh, lift capacity, tremendous quickness, and very, very reliable. We had, uh, most of our aircraft that went down were down because they were shot up. You have to go through periodic maintenance, of course, like with any piece of machinery. But we had an aircraft shot up every four or five days. Every time you take some rounds, they got to go through it and check it, and you'd have to get another aircraft. But this was, and, and by the way, if they'd have just taken the Huey, put another engine on it, give us a radar altimeter and some upgraded avionics, you'd have never needed the Blackhawk. You'd have never needed it. And it, this thing would have been good for the world forever. Now, if you're going to use the Blackhawk for troop carrying, it's, it's a little more survivable. It'll take more Gs than this one will in a crash. Certainly, it's a good machine. But not, for what we did, this was just fine. Now, I know, you know, we, we love to, for obvious reasons, romanticize the, the Mustang and the P-40s and those great airplanes. But there's some things about the number of combat missions and what this aircraft did that are not generally understood. And I know that's a little bit of a hot button with That's you. a hot button with me, you bet. This is the most combat experienced aircraft in the history of aviation. And you don't see it in a lot of, a lot of uh, museums. Museum of Flight in Seattle didn't have one. A good friend of mine there, guy of some influence, Bruce McCaw, said we need a U in there. So they put a U in there with all those fixed wing things all over the place, never done nothing, never been nowhere. And this bird's been everywhere, done everything. I think it had like <clears throat> over seven million hours of combat time. Seven million hours, 16 million sorties or something. Incredible number. Of course, we lost a lot in Vietnam. People in my business, one out of three were a casualty to what they did. Crew members, pilots. I think we killed, I don't know, 200 and some pilots. I think we lost over 200 of dust off aircraft in, in Vietnam. So it was, it was risky, and, uh, but very, very effective. There was not a battlefield operating system in combat in Vietnam more effective than this bird. Not artillery, not infantry, nothing did its job better than this bird in far as saving lives go. General, on, on the day that you saved, was it 51 or 52? There was rare rescue. Yeah, we well, they said 51, but we probably got 70 or 80 out that day. I've, <clears throat> I've read the description in your book. I've heard you talk about it. I'm still not sure, having never flown a helicopter, if I understand it. I wonder if you could just okay. have people understand 
the, right. the trick of flying up the side. All right, here's here were the here were the challenges my second tour. <clears throat> First tour we're in the Delta, flat terrain. I mean it's one great big force landing area, not a problem. Second tour we're in the mountains and you got the afternoon clouds and you got the low valley fog in the morning. That was killing our people. So I have all young pilots and I know they're going to push themselves and the dust off crews were getting killed regularly by this time, 1967. So I have no idea how we're going to get them out in weather in daytime or at night, which is even worse. So I found a couple techniques and uh, one of them was, as, this, as I told the story earlier today, soldier was bit by a snake and he was on a mountaintop. We got there in August, September. This was in November. We hadn't had anybody killed yet. We'd, we'd had a lot of our aircraft shot up and people wounded, but nobody killed. And so I went up the mountain <clears throat> straight into the stuff. You got the mountain here and you got the valley here. The clouds come down the mountain to about right here. So you go into, you go IFR, you don't know if you're upside down, right side up, but I could fall out in the valley and I would break out and I knew that was okay. So after doing it, I went up fourth or fifth time and they're screaming that he's going into convulsions and come please dust off, please. So I went up and I was blown sideways. That, w that, that was a breath of God. And I had this window down always. And as I said, I always led with the right pedal. And I looked out the window and I could see that far in that stuff. I could see the tip of that rotor blade. That's as far as I could see. But I could also see, the. Tr I thought we were going into the trees. I was looking for a hole in the trees because I was sure we were going to crash. But I could see the tip of the rotor blade as I looked out the window and I could see the top of the trees. Guess what? I got two reference points. I know I'm right side up. So I turned it sideways and I went up the mountain sideways. And that's the same technique I use for the day that I got the Medal of Honor. I did that four times with low valley fog. Not top, but the low valley fog, which is like a snow bank. But you dip into it, rotor blade, trees, terrain, and you work your way through it sideways. Piece of cake. Nobody can see you. And so you're perfectly safe. Night, night was a trick. <clears throat> I was sitting out in an area we call uh, that they call over there Death Valley, and I'm watching a firefight at night. And if you've ever seen a firefight at night, it's just a beautiful thing. You know, you got the tracers, the different colored tracers, and you got the flares coming down through the clouds, and the mountains, it was during a, uh, some weather, the mountains are covered with uh, fog or clouds. And I looked up at a mountain with the flare, and I could see the mountain there was a silhouette of the mountain and it just kind of stuck in my head so a short time later we get a call to pick up some 101st guys in the valley during a tropical storm now on the delta and the delta we would fly with this and the crew members would lay with their head out the window they'd lay on the floor with their head out the door and they would watch behind for a light on both sides and we would watch for a light in front so it's like ink and it's a tropical storm so I see a light I would fly towards that light and these guys would say okay I can still see lights behind us because we didn't want to go we didn't want to go IFR there was no letdown facilities and we could we could have got up above it and it would not have been too much of a problem but you're not going to get the patient that way so then I had a vision <clears throat> of that mountaintop in the clouds, in the silhouette of that uh, mountain with those flares. I knew exactly how I was gonna get those guys out. I went back, we had a, we had a float ship. I went back and got a, uh, a, a ship with good instruments on it. I knew the mountains were about uh, four or 5,000 feet high, I think. So I gave myself a 1,000 feet <clears throat> clearance from the mountains and I got, a new, I got another pilot. I used three pilots that night and a couple crews and I told the radar people at Chulai, vector me to these coordinates. So I went up to a thousand feet above the mountains and they gave me a vector. 
Now once I get over the area out there, there's an Air Force ship at about 9,000 feet dropping flares. The idea was to catch a flare out the window and follow it down through the mountains. But they got to keep a flare in the sky at all times because you get it 1,500 feet in 5,000 feet mountains, you're in trouble. You can't go either way, you got to go straight up. And that happened a couple times. And finally, uh, they, got the, they got the picture, we came down under it, we got, made four trips in that night and got them all out. And now that, that they found out later, there was a lot of publicity associated with it because apparently it hadn't been done before and so they, they that, for that mission I got the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest award. So that was actually more spectacular in terms of the system and the, se the technique used than the day I got the Medal of Honor. There's 3,000 missions and there's there's never any time to hesitate when it's time you you had to climb you know when it's time to go it's time to go I heard you say a breath of God I heard you say you had a vision of a yeah. mountaintop epiphany okay uh, do you want to talk about it? Did your faith play into this yeah, it's, it was for me it was everything because you know they say uh, you all always talk about guys that they're the tremendous fear they have here and there and I've seen that fear and it's a horrifying thing it will kill you fear will cause to happen the thing that caused it if you can sort that out and I never experienced fear for me it was I didn't care if I got killed I was doing the right thing I was saving American lives the greatest citizens we have in this country soldiers if I got killed doing that that's God's will forget about it what I was focused on was what kind of weapons does he have uh, how close is he to you and then from that from that information I looked at the terrain and, you know for example here's a, a rice paddy the enemies in this tree line the friendlies are in this tree line there's a riverbed right here so you don't go in like that you're you're gonna get killed you go down in the riverbed you stay down in the riverbed behind the trees you hop up over the trees you turn your tail into the fire always you do not want the bullets coming through the windshield you want them going through the transmission. You set down, you load up, up over the trees and back out. That's a tactical approach and it works. If the terrain suits it and if everything else suits it, that's how we flew. So I was busy analyzing the terrain, trying to figure out what's the best way in there, mixing it in my mind, and then I would see, I would have a vision of the, the approach. There would be a highway just come out of the sky and just take me down through that riverbed, up over those trees, turn around, and go out the same way. In the meantime, you got to coordinate with the guy on the ground. You're going to stand up, right? You got all, you got all the patients in one location, right? We're not going to hover around down there looking for patients. You bet, dust off. We got them all right and waiting for you. You just come into the smoke and we'll load them and you're on your way. And so that, you were so busy focusing, there was no time for fear or anything like that. If we could go back just a little bit and talk, uh, anything you would care to share about the tail assembly? Well, we had, uh, you know, when you're when you're in a conf when you're making a picked up in a confined area in triple canopy jungle, there were times when you would make the pickup where you couldn't see the sky. In other words, you come down through one layer, you move over, you come down through another layer, you move over till you get down to the ground. You couldn't land most of the time. They'd have to load the patients up like that, and you had somebody always with their eyes on that tail rotor. You lose a tail rotor, you spin in, that's the end of it. And I would watch the pilot and the co-pilot, we watched the trees in relation to the main rotor. The crew was watching the tail rotor. So you had to be very, very careful. And they would, they were my eyes. They would say, okay, dust off, or double nickel, uh, come down, okay, back up, go to your right, come on down. And they would work, work me into the area. I couldn't have done it without them. So, would, would you have had the unwavering will to do what you did if you had not worked for Kelly? You know what? That's a good question. Uh, 
If it hadn't been for Kelly, we wouldn't have had a job. The, the, somebody else would have had those birds. And those of us who were medically trained, we wouldn't have had a job. We'd be flying for gunships or slick ships or something like that. But I do think that I, I had great empathy for the guy on the ground because I was an infantry, I worked with the infantry for three years before I went to flight school. I was in Berlin when they built the wall, so I saw that crisis and I saw what, what these people went, do, went through, the infantry guys in the ground, on the mud, in those horrible conditions and you know I'm going home sleeping in a bed come on give me a break so I I had great empathy for that guy and I believe that wherever I was not only me but most of the dust off pilot we're going to do what Kelly taught us to do and if there was no Kelly there would be no us in a sense and so but he was the inspiration he was the absolute inspiration he saved my career and in other ways and so this guy was uh, he was unique do you mind repeating the story of the individual that suggested to you that because of what happened to Kelly it's time to curb your enthusiasm oh, yeah, yeah. well the day <clears throat> it's a the, the, the prelude to the story was that Kelly promised me I could come and take his place in the Delta we had two birds down there because the fight was going on in Saigon with Stillwell and keeping our Red Crosses. So he said, Brady, come down and march. Oh, come on. He, there was so much flying going on. Now he didn't want to leave. He was having a ball. So many patients. And so finally one day he said to me, he said, Brady, you can come to the Delta on 1 July. Well, 1 July, I hadn't heard anything until he got killed. He was killed on 1 July. So I went down there, I spent that night in his bed, wrote up the missions from his desk, and the next day the uh, battalion commander, the aviation battalion commander for the whole Delta called me, and I think his name was Robinson. And he says, okay, Brady, he says, it finally happened. We knew the way you guys were flying. We we're the only people flying at night, the only people going on the battlefield. He said, I knew somebody's going to get killed, but I didn't think it'd be Kelly. I thought it'd be one of the young pilots. And he said, so you guys need to change the way you do business. And I said, we ain't changing nothing. We're going to fly just the way Kelly taught us to fly. He didn't own me, see. Somebody in Saigon owned me, so he couldn't tell me how to fly, although he owned all the aviation resources in the valley. So I said, we're going to do exactly what Kelly taught us. We ain't going to change a thing. So when I was leaving the office, he said, oh, I got something for you. And he gave me the bullet that killed Kelly. It had gone right through his heart, right through here. He didn't wear a flak vest. And uh, I did, and the rest of us did. It didn't stop much, but it might, you know, might just slow up a 30 caliber. So it went through him and lodged in the door. It was the only bullet that hit the aircraft. And it, so it made people think that maybe there was a sniper there waiting for Kelly because he was spreading so much goodwill in the Delta. As I said, villages came out to watch him carry away their wounded Vietnamese children and women and everything, and they loved him. And so in the VC, anytime they found someone like that, they wanted to kill him. And it may be that that's what they did that time. We don't know. But anyhow, he gave me, I still got it. I still have the bullet. I, I went to the family with it, and they said, let's think about it. And so, so but I still have it.